Hello, this is me again, and so this is the fourth lecture in the series of two about non-isolated singularities and polar degree. And I always want to start with some pictures. So do we have already something on the screen? Yes, it's, it's me, so, but uh, is the connection there ready? Can I share the screen? 
Okay, so the it's there, yes. Okay. So I always like to get uh, to start with some nice pictures, and, and here you see some pictures from the server. But I have even some nicer pictures, and I will show them now to you. You, if you go upstairs and uh, you go to the studio, you see this impress impressive image. Lots of uh, computers, uh, lots of cameras. There are three cameras here around, and uh, and, and the connection with uh, Anna Frubis was there, and you can see part of the lecture. But especially what you see is also the person who made all the technique. And you, in this photo, you can even see him better. And I think it's uh, very useful to say thank you for all the things you make here. And I also know from people abroad that they are very happy with looking to this picture. OK, so this is the introduction. And now we go on at the point we have been. So we have uh, the last time we talked about color degree. And uh, I went very fast through the beginning, but I will now start again with the definition and explain a little bit about the history and why uh, color degree seems to be important. So as I said before, we have a homogeneous polynomial of degree D. And, um, and this defines a hypersurface in the N. And then the polar degree is the topological polar degree. So this is the connection with Nicolas' lecture. So I'll try to make more connections. Um, it is just a number of points of uh, the inverse image of a regular of a certain map. And the map is the gradient map. So what I said, you take the N plus one part to the and you take them as a projective point. So you put no commas, but the double dots in between. And so that means that you have a map from the projective space to the projective space. This is defined everywhere except where all the derivatives are zero. It's the point zero, 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 zero. And to a point in the projective plane. If you look to this map, then um, there is a, is a discriminant. Uh, generically, you have an everywhere, but there are in the inverse image, but there are certain points where you don't have this number, don't have this maximum number of points, uh, especially when And then since this map is not this point is a singular point, there's no image, uh, there will there is uh, some other piece of the discriminant. This uh, is related to the non-properness. Okay, then if you take a point over here, then you can find a number of counter images. Another way thing is if you take a, a, a tension vector here, and, and then at the point here, which defines a tension vector, and um, and the dual of it is, is normal. And you take an image of it for all the points that you find to show that you, and the, 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 this kind of um, of points where the curvature is going to change, they 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 are the uh, correspond to the plus over here. So in this real picture, you have a lot of, uh, of uh, geometry to see. And uh, so in certain sense, all what I'm going to say is about the complex numbers. And I, I well, while doing so, I have the idea that the theory of, uh, that you could do also some things of the reals. But it has have not seen any any kind of studies about that. Okay, now uh, 
the Espola degree is uh, very well developed in the beginning time by algebraic geometers and the algebraic part. And ar around 2000 uh, became the topological part. And that's what the part I have reported yesterday. And that is Tolkachev list and the, that the color degree is something topological. But now I focus for a moment a little bit more on the algebraic definition. If you have a smooth hypersurface, then um, then you can differentiate it. And uh, then, you, as, as you differentiate with respect to x0, then you get uh, x to the power d minus 1, and the order is similar. So it seems that you have the, the d minus 1 to the power n plus 1 solutions, but you have to count in the complex, in the projective plane, so you can all multiply by roots of unity, so in fact there are only d minus 1 to the power n left. Then the other is what people call the projective group. So these are defined by functions by one variable. So x0 is not in the answer. And, and this you have to think about that it can really be called a cone. But now we focus on the fact that the polar degree is equal to zero. Okay, how to do? So the definition is uh, look at the gradient map and count, uh, take a generic value and count the number of counts. Uh, of counter input. Okay, but what happens here is that the regular value, and still the sound here, that uh, the regular value, uh, this image of the gradient, uh, it, it contains not a clear function. So there is, uh, so to say, the derivative with respect to x0 is zero. That means that uh, all the the image of this map lies in a hypersurface, so that the degree has to be zero. And the, the example of uh, Nicolas yesterday had also some examples of the P0 if, if something was not in the image. Then there are, uh, are some determinantal singularities, which have a, a certain polar degree. So it is, is the Henkel type determinant. And if you do your computation, you find that the polar degree is equal to one. So you can do this as homework. Uh, there is something, uh, another guy which is even more interesting. That is the determinantal surface. You take the determinant, A, as function, function of all its entries. So you have n squared entries. And, and then you have in C n squared, you have this hypersurface determinant A is zero, and you can take now the corresponding hypersurface in the projective space. This is polar degree equal to one. Why? Okay, so the explanation is low. You have to differentiate your map, determinant A. And what happens if you, if you differentiate uh, the A with respect to this xij, then you get here a column with one on this place and zero at the other places. So this means that, uh, in fact, if you take the determinant, you get a minor of the other matrix. So if you take all the partial derivatives of A, then you get a matrix where this matrix contains all the minors of, of the matrix A. And when you remember Kramer's rule, to compute the inverse of a matrix, you get a matrix of minors or cofactors divided by the determinant of A. So this formula tells you that the gradient map has an inverse on the space where the determinant of A is non-zero. Okay, so this is the proof that the degree is equal to one, since if you have an inverse, then the degree is one. And 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 the uh, degree is one. We call that homo homoloidal. Yesterday uh, is of big interest 
since then the, the, the map is biholomorphic or birational. birational. Okay, now I have an exercise and we're going to solve this here. Determine the topology of the complex links of the determinal hypersurface in CN squares. I've just defined the determinant on all these kinds of uh, digits in the matrix. So this is the space in CN squared. And now I take the complex link, generic hyperplane. Is there anyone here who can tell me what the topological type of this complex link is? Only one or everybody? No, and then I will say, okay, we had a second definition of holography, an equivalent one. And the equivalent one was that it was the complex link of the variety of the hypersurface at the point. And we now, and we knew that the complex link is a bouquet of spheres, and the number of spheres is equal to the polar degree. So in this case, we have polar degree equal one, so our space is homotopy equivalent to a sphere of dimension uh, n squared or n squared minus one, I should be the middle dimension. So, and it's also the case for, 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 for the, if you take the complex link for the cone over the, this ankle determinant. So it's just the affine part. And so this connects a little bit with the determin determinantal singularities. And um, if you replace your your, uh, your general entries by homogeneous functions or deform this in homogeneous functions, you can follow uh, a, a set of uh, determinantal singularities and look to the polar degrees. Okay, then the case polar degree is zero. Yeah, there is a question. So I. Yeah, that is that is known. You find it in papers of Mont or of Damon, and I don't remember which papers. And it's also true for the symmetric matrices. And as soon as the polar degree is equal to one, you have this link. So, but this is uh, the, the proof is from a little bit other point of view. Okay, so this is not, uh, the microphone was not there, but uh, I repeated the question more or less. So then we go to polar degree equal to zero. And um, it was Hesse, so 170 years ago. He, he said, when the, the Hesse determinant is identically zero, which is the equivalent to polar degree is zero, if and only if the map is a projective cone. That means that you can rewrite your your uh, uh, function uh, to a function with one variable less. Uh, why uh, is this determinant, the Hessian determinant, important? So since the the Hessian uh, the, the gradient map is regular, if it's Jacobian, it's non-zero, and this Jacobian is just the Hessian. But um, it was not true. Uh, although one could show that it was true for ternary and quartic cubics. But then came the counterexample in 1876. Uh, Gordon and Neuter, they showed that it is only true up to bidirectional uh, transformations. And in fact, any relation between the partial derivatives if you that the polar degree is equal to zero, since if you have a relation between the partial derivatives, the image is not a full image, but a hypersurface. So uh, regular values are not in the image. This means that it is zero. And because uh, why uh, uh, did it go wrong with Hesse? Because he had only considered linear relations and not uh, relations in the ideal. And, and a famous example, which also finds in the paper of Jun is a two-dimensional singular set 
in this this is x0 up to x4 and this has a, uh, this has polar degree equal to zero it has all the variables and cannot fit in, in less variables and um, i think it's a good exercise uh, also in stratification to study from that point of view this example and if you look well if you can take x0 x1 and x2 as as parameters they define the singular set they are parameters on the singular set and the transversal singularity is x3 to the power d minus one times constant so you see that the, you have a, a, a two variables of the three d minus one so in the transversal direction you have a set of lines and the lines are moving uh, just as it happens in, in the cross ratio example um, and you get the, this uh, yeah, you, you get some nice geometry to see okay so this is i think this is the history no not completely we think the polar degree equal to one people find that very important it has the name cremona transformation and um the examples mentioned most of them uh, we have already mentioned this one, uh, but also a generic arrangement of hyperplanes in P3. One way to see that is that you, you know that the complex link is, uh, is a single sphere. And the list of Dolkashev, which was here yesterday. Um, the, 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 this uh, algebraic approach uh, is, is that, uh, it's a great contribution from uh, Simis, from Hisifa, so a, a great uh, a Brazilian uh, contribution to this approach. Um, going back to this example, the two-dimensional singular set, uh, the, my question came up in my mind, do there exist uh, a certain thing with a one-dimensional singular set? And um, I, the, I could not find examples in the literature. And so the question is, do they exist? And I asked Simis, and he said, I know, up to now, I know no example. So I can put this as an exercise. Uh, you give an example of polar degree zero with a one dimensional singular set, or prove that they don't exist. I don't think it's easy. We tried, and we did not. Uh, successful um, and we have also seen that for isolated singularities polar degree one uh, uh, nearly uh, there's only a very small list and the idea is that if you have more variables then they can exist if you have big singularity sets and that they are necessary in certain sense they have to 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 to, they need to may have more or less rulings in them to, to get this result. Then, uh, then there is a general statement that the polar degree is semi-continuous, and this is a this is a good exercise in um, in degree. So I have a space here, I have a map, and um, it's the image, and I have to take a counterpoint. So what I get for a regular value, I get a number of counter images. And there is the so-called pancake theorem, that if you take a neighborhood of this point, then there are around all these guys, pancakes with uh, the project one to one on the original pancake. What happens if I change my, uh, my map a little bit? Then, um, in certain sense, these regular points, they move a little bit in space. Yeah, but they, they are regular points, so they are, they are fine. So I get, uh, if I remove the the map, I get more or less the same set of points repeated. There is perhaps small pancakes from a smaller pancake over here. So it seems that this is anyhow the same number. 
But due to the fact that the thing is non-proper, there could be something else for this regular value for the perturbed thing. So that means that, uh, that, uh, that in a very easy way you show that this is semi -contiguous. No assumption about isolated singularities. This is always true. Then we talked yesterday about the Dimka Papadima formula. And the Dimka Papadima formula, this is this formula for isolated singularities. And you know that Mihai and me, we, we always like to look to non-isolated singularities. And as first case, we always take the one-dimensional singular set. So the point is, what happens if you have a one-dimensional singular set? The answer, we could solve it. And we have a formula. And in this formula, you see the Milner numbers of isolated singularities of V. You see a part uh, for the non-isolated singularities in general and for special non-isolated singularities. And I will show this formula using some other file. So I go back to the file I had in the first week. There was a piece in that file that I did had not treated before. It was the part which is really connected to the really connected to the piece of Lorentzio. So homogeneous polynomial of the VD, uh, which defines a hypersurface, and then we had the kind of construction of making a family out of it. A family by taking a generic. Uh, a degree d polynomial and make a small movement. And then we had this construction that we took a neighborhood of the zero fiber in this new space modulo its boundary. And its boundary is regular since epsilon is not zero. And we call that the vanishing homology. I'm better show that in the next picture. This was also there in some sense. I want to compute so to say, the homology of the black space. And I want to compare this with the homology of the blue thing, which is the smoothing of the black thing. What I'm going to do is to make a small tube where the blue thing is on the boundary and the, uh, the black thing is in the middle. And I look to the difference in the homology between the tube and the regular fiber. And the regular fiber is something which is known. This is the generic uh, hypersurface of the 3D. And uh, Lorenzo computed everything what you wanted to compute about it. Uh, so it, we call this the finishing homology. You have to deal a little bit with the, with the access point, but they were innocent. And then you see in this case, that the finishing homology is just the sum of the local contributions. Because if you look to dimensions, uh, oh, I have also to say that the tube itself is, um, um, uh, is, is, is contractible to the black thing. Thus, in certain sense, you compare the V with its smoothing. And this, uh, this uh, if you look to the Euler characteristic or to the homology, is concentrated in one dimension. And what you exactly get is the sum of the Milner numbers. That was used in the proof of the um, of the, the Dima Papadima formula. If you want to do this in the in the in the okay, this is you can in the one-dimensional case you look to this picture. Uh, now the red thing is uh, the one-dimensional set of singularities. So in this picture, you have the idea that here is an isolated singularity, and here there are non-isolated singularities. Uh, in certain places, the type, the transversal type of the non-isolated singularity can change. So all what you have to do is to put this in pieces, 
very behavior is, 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 is the same. So you first cut out all neighborhoods of special points. So isolated singularities and special points uh, here. And then you are left with a kind of loop where the transverse of type is more or less constant. You can see this also in the next picture. Uh, this is uh, what you see here is a part of the singular set. In red, you have the special point. Also here and here, also the, these are also special points. And uh, in the transversal direction, you have uh, the, uh, the, the Milner fiber, so to say. So this picture you take, so we have cut it, you know exactly all the pieces. And, and uh, I'm not going to explain now exactly what the pieces are, but you have control. And then what you do is you do Euler characteristics. So you so you, you, you count all the Euler characteristics or in this case. And then in this theorem, we look at this moment only at the third piece. This tells you that the Euler, vanishing Euler characteristic is the sum of the one-dimensional things. So the sigma star are the one-dimensional pieces of the singular locus, times the transversal Milner number, minus the uh, Euler characteristic of the special points on the one-dimensional singular set, plus the Euler characteristic of the uh, isolated singularities. This was also called uh, the Parusinski Prakras. Uh, and so at this moment, the only thing I know uh, I, I need is this. But, not so time, uh, time. Um, the statement here is longer and can be useful if you want to compute more homology groups. You see that, uh, as an example, that uh, the, the n plus second Betty number, this was one of the Betty numbers that you cannot get from the general theory, is always lesser equal than these transversal Milner numbers. And if you have one of these strange things over here, which if one of these homology groups is zero, then you know that the n plus second petty number is zero. And um, this happens in those cases. It happens in those cases, it will be there, where this, don't read this, only look at this. Look to those cases. We had defined transversal monodromies last week, and perhaps you have all forgotten that, then you, 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 you don't listen for a moment. So if this kernel is zero, all these kernels are zero, uh, then this is zero. And this happens especially in those cases where you have the infinity points. As soon as you have one in the infinity points in the examples we have seen before, then you kill. Uh, uh, the, the, the this uh, finishing homology. Okay, I wanted to say that since we uh, this, we found it uh, yeah, a lot of nice fact. But so I go back to this formula, and this formula appears also. Uh, okay, it's just a book. Going back to this over here, this formula uh, is is more or less. Uh, the formula I've seen here, these contributions. So you plug in, in the theory, this contribution. And that leads to the, to the following proof. What was polar degree? The polar degree was the Betty number, highest Betty number of the affine part for generic age. So this is topological definition. And the, 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 okay, and the polar degree of the generic hypersurface um, is, is similar. So if you take the difference, and the difference is just the finishing homology, related to the finishing homology, you get the difference of these two Euler characteristics. Only. 
in the slides I have seen, let you see before you get that this difference is this rather complicated uh, 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 formula. And I made no mistakes in copying it. But you also need, you, you need not C, but you need C minus a generic hyperplane. So you have to, to take out the intersection. For the intersection, you have the same type of formula, but now you can use the original, this isolated singularities, so you get only this term. And then you do everything. Okay, so you do. Uh, yeah, you, you have to compute the other characteristics of sigma star, and you apply this, and you are ready. So, in, in fact, this is, if you write down all these all these formulas, it looks very complicated. But as soon as you have the formula for the vanishing Euler characteristic, you are ready. And this is the the general statement is that the polar degree is d minus one to the n the minus plus or minus the differences in vanishing Euler characteristics. And the only difference between the earlier formula is that we have just formulas for these guys in terms of local constitutions. Okay, we have not so far to go anymore. Um, people like to, to, to study examples. And of course, then you get the questions, what are interesting examples? And uh, cubic surfaces, they also very geometers always like them. And of course, the isolated singularities, the cubic surfaces, is isolated singularities are classified. And then you 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 look what what uh, how they are, and then you see that uh, the, you compute the polar degrees. And the polar degrees, the, the you they are listed here. And, but you see there are no homoloidal surfaces. And we, we knew that already. Okay, so so if you're looking for these homoloidal surfaces, the isolated singularities, they uh, of the, of cubics, they don't give you any result. By the way, this is already on the web, so you can read everything uh, if the web is there. And of course, uh, I like all these pictures, and this uh, is our, uh, are some pictures of surfaces with polar degree too. So they are. Some of them were in the list. Then you have irreducible cubics with non-isolated singularities. And they are all listed, and it, 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 it has no sense to, to tell you exactly uh, what they are. But uh, if you look special to polar degree 1, you find here one met with the polar degree 1. And they, so the singular set has two special points of type D infinity in the first case, and what was the first case? We follow the degree two. So this is uh, something which looks like this. You should have some picture in. So the, this is the double line, and then you get it, it something here. So you get something with two wetting umbrellas. In fact, all these classifications are mostly over the complex numbers. But as soon as you want to write real, micro, real pictures, then it's interesting over the reals. And I think these cubics have be, perhaps been done over the reals, but many things have not been done over the reals. So if you want to have a good kind of, of uh, master thesis, uh, you can ask to do, try to find out that and that things over the reals and draw the pictures. And then there are is still some other set. Uh, where the polar degrees have been computed, the union of a quadratic is a tangent hyperplane, and um, all non-isolated, and there are many more. And from the results, uh, you find that there are only three homoloidal cubic surfaces, which have, and all of them have non-isolated singularity. So this is uh, is not the end of what I'm going to say, but this is the list of uh, of references. 
And um, there are, there are still some general things I like to say. Uh, okay, so let's, let's go back and try to get some picture again here on the screen. Okay, so this is always a nice picture. Um, what I like in singularity theory is that it has so many different aspects. And that you can uh, combine various areas of mathematics and uh, and and very streams in singularity theory. Those who really like algebra and really up to the end, and those like me who actually really like the topology, and you meet each other and you see at certain moments also that the opinion of, of the one side is important for the other side, and you also meet. People from various other other directions, uh, sometimes in um, combinatorics, in theory, and other things. But there is still one connection I want to explain at the end of the talk, which uh, brings a connection between deformation theory and um, uh, of uh, normal surfaces. And this is the, the guy I always write down, y squared v squared is equal to zero. And so this was this picture. Almost this picture, okay, why is this? Uh, yes, I go to... Uh -huh. okay. Roman Steiner stuff. Okay, so it's uh, it, it, it's this picture. If you add as deformation minus x, x, y, z is equal to zero. But for s is zero, this is a singularity where the singular set is three lines. And what I said is that the deformation theory of this singularity, so this family gave you the Roman Steiner surface, which I can make a little bit bigger. Uh, can I make it bigger? Let's try. Yes. So then you get the Roman Steiner surface, but there is a second deformation. The second deformation is that you deform. I can also write this over here, since I have this in the other paper. And I showed this already in the exercise session. I'll go back to uh, courses, today lecture. Here. It's just here upstairs. Okay, yeah, here, this, this second formula, you see x, y is deformed and then squared. So these three uh, deformation with three parameters is, is an other deformation. And the other deformation, it, it makes the, the, the second deformation Moses the singular set. And you can see that from the formula, they have the appear this, this kind of, of curve, and perhaps the curve can be computed in uh, any any the normalization can be computed. This is not too difficult here, I think. But here is the deformation of the curve, which is followed. By this formula, this is a deformation of the hypersurface. So what you have is a deformation uh, a space which uh, consists of two components, a three-dimensional and a one-dimensional, intersecting in one point. And at that moment, if you tell it to an algebraic geometer, he says Pinkham example. No, this is not the Pinkham example. Since the Pinkham example is a space, Pinkham is a surface, 
sitting in C5 or C5. And if you take the deformation, and it's normal, and if you take the deformation of this guy, then the deformation space is one dimensional in one direction and three dimensional in the other direction. So, what is the interaction between those? Since this is living in C3, you take a more or less generic projection of this surface in C3. And then there is no space enough to 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 be uh, non-singular outside the origin. You have to you need some crossing over, and that are just the singular set of the image. And then Van Straten and De Jong Prove the theorem, and that is uh, the, the, the deformation theory of these uh, normal surface singularities in general, and the deformation theory of those projections, these are called uh, weakly normal singularities, are identical up to a smooth spectrum. So this shows that the deformation theory of normal surface singularity and the deformation theory of uh, uh, I, uh, of this kind of singularity is this a one dimensional set and so first of type A1 uh, are very nearly related. And that brings again some re relation between my talk and some people who uh, want to, to uh, uh, consider deformations of normal surface singularities. Well, I think my time is over. Thank you very much. And again, why you thought about uh, Bingham's example with this uh, Veronese type of? Uh, yeah, why so did you connect it with Bingham? So, so it, this is known as Bingham example. Oh. Uh, so this uh, this uh, cone over uh, something, uh, but I see it as a normalization of this guy, mm. and then you find the cone over I think a quartic surface or something oh. like. But I'm not not. Okay. Good in remembering that. So, so this is the, the main reference that the deformation theory of both uh, are more or less identical. Okay. So, no questions. There will be no extra, no exercise session anymore. So, if you really want to know something, you go to me and. One, one question about the nut. Yeah. So the the surface C three has non isolated singularity. Yes. Right? And when you deform the, the Pinkham surface yeah. upstairs, you deform something smooth. Yeah. Uh, or no. you deform to something smooth. Uh, I think uh, you have a smoothing component, but there are also other components. Where where the where you find uh, still singular points. In your deformation. That's yeah. what I remember from uh, from the work. Yeah, maybe maybe in the one component you can have singularities yes, remaining. You can, yes, yes, in, uh, yeah, and, and but you can deform to something something smooth eventually. You can anyhow smooth uh, use the three dimensional component to smooth, and the other component gives you something else. But my question then is um, the normalization yeah. going down. Does yeah. it uh, does it reproduce singularities or? Yes. If you, if you if you, if you go down, then uh, the the other example is so to say the Whitney umbrella. So for the for the surface in C three, you only you're only allowed to consider very special deformations that. Preserve some singular yes, yes, structure. Yes, so this is. So if you take the Whitney example and you take its normalization, then you have a smooth plane. 
and then you fold it over. And in the place where you do this overfold, you get a singular set of this weekly, weekly normal type. And of course, if you put your plane a little bit strange in space, in a high dimensional space, then you can anyhow find the projection where you have the Whitney umbrella. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I think the audience for uh, for the listening and uh, and then we have tuned the next talk.
get started in just a minute here. Thank you. So thank you for your patience while we were waiting to get started here. This is lecture two in the course on determinal singularities, and it's devoted to the equisingularity of EIDS. So first, I have to recall some things from last, last week, first on ISIS, and we have some notation here. Uh, this is familiar to everybody who went to my lecture last week. This is a family of spaces, and I'm thinking of X is my fiber over zero here, and it sits inside some larger family of things. Y is the parameter space we project to Y. And uh, we, this always notes the total space of the family. We always assume that the thing is equidimensional with equidimensional fibers. And we usually assume that Y is actually contained inside the total space. Okay. Then we have some general overarching notation. Capital F will usually be the map that defines the family, and little f sub y will be the restriction of capital X to, to, uh, to the value where parameter is y, and this will define the set x of y. And then we have some notation for the singular set. S of x will always denote the singular locus of x, whatever x is. Okay, very good. What are we going to do this week? Well, in the ISIS course, we showed two big theorems right at the end of the course. The first was a sufficiency theorem. So you have a family. It's made up of ISIS. And then we have some invariants, which we talked about a little bit. The multiplicity of the maximal ideal times the Jacobian module. And if these invariants were constant, independent of y, then not only was x minus y smooth, but the pair satisfied the w condition. We also had a necessity result. Now here we have to do something a little bit stronger. We need to assume that X minus Y is smooth for this to work, so that's an assumption. And we're also assuming W. And then the mu star sequence of XY, remember the mu star sequence was the sequence of Miller numbers of the plane sections of XY. That must be constant, as well as the multiplicity of the maximal ideal times the Jacobian modules. Okay, why was this a good theorem? Well, the invariants depend only on the members of the family. They don't depend on the family itself. And they also only depend on what's happening around the origin. So can we do this for non-isolated singularities? And the answer is that I hope to convince you that the EIDS, the AIDS, are an exa example where we can. So the invariants are independent of family, but as we'll see, they depend on the landscape. So this is a report of joint work with Maria Apresidia Ruas, and it appeared in, in the paper that I've listed as the Ruas 2021. So, introduction, landscapes and determinal singularities. Well, you might wonder why we study non-isolated singularities. Uh, it says in the slides, there's many situations where the set to be studied has an additional structure which you want to preserve, and you want to study families that preserve this structure. Uh, if you have, you're looking at images of finite maps, then you may want to preserve this property in deformations of the set. Deciding on the structure you want to preserve is the first step in deciding on the landscape of the singularity. And as Sedina said in her lecture, the landscape we're thinking of these days as being the allowable deformations. So we look at the structure and that allows us to decide what the allowable deformations are. And then we have the landscape. As an example, we have the Whitney umbrella this lives in three different landscapes. And depending on which landscape you pick, determines what do you have in the way of deformations. It's rigid in two of them, 
Well, every hypersurface, if you think about it just as a hypersurface without any structure, can be deformed to a smooth manifold. Okay, so let's look at the landscape of determinantal singularities. So we choose to represent a determinantal singularity as we did in the first lecture, using a map into the space of matrices. The allowable deformations of F are gotten by deforming F and taking minors of size T. Okay. Now this is, is great because we can deform F freely. There's no restrictions on what F has to be to meet. The generic objects in our landscape, well, they're going to be transverse sets. So a transverse set, keep this picture in mind, I have some stratification like this. And then this would be a transfer set. It is transverse to every stratum in the Whitney stratification of the thing. If I have a one parameter deformation such that the deformation is transverse, the rank stratification, and we call that a stabilization. And the base it defines is called an essential smoothing. It may not be smooth, but it is a rigid object. And uh, X tilde is called an essential smoothing family. Okay. So we see that every determinantal singularity has a deformation to a transfer set. And if we fix a representative of an IDES, Okay, so this is important. Let's move away. We have a representative, so we move away from the, the origin a little bit, and now we have something that is a generic object. Given an allowable deformation of X, it is reasonable to hope that the data from X, which measures the failure of transversality and a little bit from the universal object will determine if the deformation is equisingular, equisingular or not. Why is this a reasonable hope? Well, it has to do with the fact that we have a generic object except at the origin. If things are already as good as they can be except at the origin, we only really have to worry about what's happening at the origin. Our invariant should be uh, defined there and that should be enough. Okay, so... Now, how about the ISIS case? Well, the universal object was zero. That's right, zero in CP. And the multiplicity of JMX measured the failure of transversality. Well, obviously for ISIS, we didn't have too much information from the generic object. It was just a point. But this time the generic object is gonna be much more complicated and it will come into play. Sectional singularities. Uh, a further generalization. Consider this diagram. So here I have a big, a big affine space and sitting inside of it, I have a universal object. And I can map K, Q into this affine space and I can pull back my universal object and that defines a, a, a sectional singularity, a nonlinear sectional singularity. So these sectional singularities include many classes of singularities, among them are determinal singularities, symmetric sim singularities, and so on, okay. So they're definitely worth studying. And the adaptation of the Mather theory to these sectional singularities was done by Damon in 87. And the last section, we discuss how we do this in this more gen, do our stuff in this talk in a more general situation. So let's go back to determinal singularities. And now we have obstacles that we have to overcome. These are things that were not present in the ISIS case. What are the module of infinitesimal deformations? In the ISIS case, it was a free OX module. How do we measure the difference between JMX and the infinite? How do we measure the difference between the infinitesimally trivial deformations in N? And they should be the same if X is transverse. The problem is the multiplicity of the Jacobian module here 
So here's the here, here we got the Jacobi module. The modal plus the Jacobi module won't work because it's not defined. We're going to do something else. Now here's another invariant that's interesting. So supposing we had an ISIS, then we had one of these deformations. We could take a generic linear form L mapping CN to C, and we could look at the critical points, the Morse points of L restricted to the fibers of our deformation here. And then we could count how many we had, count how many we get. Well, this is this invariant MD. And it has this nice topological interpretation as the sum of the Miller numbers of X and a hyperplane section of X, and has an infinitesimal interpretation as the multiplicity of JMX. We can define MD again using a smoothing family for determinal singularities, but then what does it mean? How does it fit with the geometry of X and the modules JM of X and N? So that's one of the obstacles we have to overcome. Okay, so now we're going to look at the determinantal normal module. So this is the module of infinitesimal deformations. Replace the part that theta f played with isis. So, well, we first deform x by deforming f, take minors of the right size and taking the first order terms in t. Okay, so one of the nice ways of taking the first order terms in T uh, can be seen in this example here. So we're going to look at N3, which is the uh, normal determinantal module for the matrices where the rank is less than 3 and M33. Great. Let's write that down. So I look at, since I'm working with the generic matrices, I start with a generic matrix and I deform it by just changing the upper left-hand corner. And that defines a deformation of M3 of, if I take the determinant size. And now we want to take the derivative, oh, I did take the term, sorry. So now we uh, take the derivative with respect to T and set it T equal to zero. This is one way of collecting the terms of first order. And this will be an element of this determinantal normal module. But on the other hand, if I do that, it's also the partial derivative of the determinant with respect to the, to the uh, variable A11. And so I could also compose my deformation. I could take, rather what I could do is I could compose A with my F and I could deform it this way also, okay? So if I do this, then I have a deformation of X3 of F inverse of M3. So this notation, uh, yeah, so what does this notation mean? So this notation means it's the pullback of the matrices where the rank is less than three. 
Anyway, we take the derivative of we take the derivative of this deformation with respect to t and set it equal to zero, and all we get is the cofactor we had before composed with f. There's no mixing of t with f, and so we take the derivative with respect to t. Nothing changes. This is an element of nx. So the generators of nt pull back to generators of nx. All right, so I want to talk about the universal objects for determinantal singularities for a little bit. These are the things that we're going to intersect with the image of F. So the universal objects are just the, the, uh, the rank singularities. And as Sidina said, they have a locally holomorphic trivial stratification given by rank. And the nice thing is that we have just seen that the determinantal normal module is the Jacobian module of MT. So what that means is, is that every infinitesimal determinal deformation, okay, every infinitesimal is infinitesimally trivial. That's what it means to have the equality of these two things. Because they're trivial, we say that NT and MT are stable. This is an adjective that goes both with the set and the normal module. So here, a little bit late. Okay, well, anyway. So here we have, uh, if we have that, if this is defined by this F here, then the determinable normal module of the X, oops, The determinantal normal module of the X is the pullback of NT. Because of this property, we say that NT is universal. Problem, show that if you take the normal determinantal module for a family, restrict it to capital Y equals some Y value, then that is the same as the determinantal normal module of X restricted to that. This restriction property is really important for what we're doing and is one of the keys to escaping uh, your results depending on families. Okay, so now I wanna talk about uh, needs and the, the multiplicity of the pair. So we first have the notion of a direct transversal. This would be an example of a direct transversal to this stratum here. It's transverse to it and it has complementary dimension. So now we have two lemmas, which are going to reduce the size of the set we have to, or the module we have to consider. So if, if X is locally holomorphic, the trivial stratification, and we have a direct transversal, then we can calculate the Jacobian module of X just by calculating the partial derivatives of the defining equations of X with respect to the vectors in T. That's all we need. Supposing you had a Whitney stratification, so we had a direct transverse of the Whitney stratification. Then what's true, JMX may not be in here, but it is in the integral closure. Now, how do you, well, let's see. So I want to talk about how we get both results, but I want to show the other lemma next. Okay. So now suppose we have a map. Suppose X has a Whitney stratification. Suppose f is transverse to s of x. Here I changed my notation a little bit. x of f denotes f inverse of x. Then the pullback of jm of x is contained in the integral closure of jm of x f. And if the stratification is holomorphically trivial, then the pullback of f star jm of x is contained in, in jm of x f. Okay, well, why are these things true? All right, let's have a look. 
Supposing T is a direct transversal. All right, this is going to be too hard to see. The picture. So here I have a direct transversal. I move this along. And we can see that what I'm going to get is a family. But this family will be, what equisingularity property does it have? It is analytically trivial because the stratification is analytically trivial. Now, if it's analytically trivial, what does that mean? Well, here's a vector, V, along S. No, that's good. There's S in my picture. If it's locally trivial, then that means if I have F, there has to be another vector field. And I can prove that I can take this other vector field in here. Let's call that V plus W. So that this is zero. And so that says that the partial of F with respect to V is contained in the Jacobian module of F uh, B. So this this statement here, lemma one, is just a, a statement of the fact that we have an analytically trivial stratification. Now applying the chain rule to uh, G, where G defines X, because F, the image of F is a direct transversal. It contain, well, the image of F, can, the image of DF contains a direct transversal. So let's write that down. So it contains a direct trans because the image contains a direct transversal. It then follows that JMX contains F star of JMGT, and hence it contains F star of NT. In the in the Whitney case, what's going on? is that we are going to use not this result, but we use the result that it is contained in the integral closure of F. And that's what it means to have a Whitney trivial stratification. Okay, proposition. This means that the multiplicity of the pair is well-defined because by the lemmas, uh, we have that the small module is equal to the big module, except perhaps it's zero. And that's what we all we need to show that the multiplicity is well defined. Now I want to talk about the invariant MD. Okay, so if we take a stabilization family, then as we said in the introduction, we have a linear function. H the kernel of P is not a limiting tangent plane to X at the origin. And we can arrange P so that it's a Morse function for S not equal to zero. And then we define MD of X to be N zero, which is the number of critical points. 
above some point in uh, in X uh, reg. So in the ISIS case, as we said, MD is equal to the Milner number plus the Milner number of H. For simplicity, we're going to let, okay. So we wanna look at the Euler characteristic of a stabilization of X. But instead of using stabilization here, we're just gonna be lazy and we'll use uh, chi X and chi X intersect H. So this means really we're looking at the stabilization here. Okay, then we have a magic number. Okay, this magic number actually comes from the generic singularity. It's the, uh, it's related to the Euler characteristic of the complex link. And then in the determinal case, what we have is that This quantity, which we would expect to take the place of the Milner number of X plus the Milner number of a hyperplane slice. Oops, that wasn't good. Almost. We lost it here. I think it's the last bit. Here we go. Okay. So here, this is the topological data. And this is MDI. What's interesting is, unlike the ISIS case, all of the strata of X are contributing to the, these Euler characteristics. And how much they contribute depends on a number which is derived from the generic singularity. So although it wasn't stated this way, this, is, this follows pretty easily from work of Ebling and Guzain Zad. Now, let's continue looking at this invariant. As I said, in the ISIS case, things are very simple. The MD turned out to be equal to the multiplicity of the Jacobian module. We're going to prove this formula probably tomorrow. We have a different story here. As we expect, we see the multiplicity of the pair, but this is new. This is something that depends only on, well, it depends on the, it depends on the generic singularity. I haven't discussed polar varieties yet. I'm going to do that uh, probably tomorrow. And here we're looking at the intersection multiplicity of the image of CQ with the polar variety, appropriate polar variety. Now notice, once I prove this formula, this formula shows that MDI is independent of the smoothing or the stabilization. It's independent of it because all the terms that appear here depend only on the germ of Xi at the origin. And this also depends only on the germ of F, the original F undeformed at the origin. What the smoothing does for us is it just moves the image so we can count points. Typically, you know, when you do intersection theory, you look at the intersection of two things and you move one thing so you can count points. That's what, this, that's what the smoothing does for us here. Okay. So here I explain what that is. It's just, as I said, the intersection of the image of F with the polar of complementary dimension. And what's new is that when you, we look at it, we'll see that this is sort of a correction term due to the curvature of the generic, curvature of the generic Jacobian module. So one proposition we have, which I won't prove today, is that the, if the image of F, the image of DF does not lie on a limit tangent plane to MT, that's true uh, if and only if 
the multiplicity of the pair is zero. So we have a criterion for this to be zero. And because of this, in some sense, the term does measure the failure of transversality, the transversality of F. So to prove this formula, we need to discuss the polar varieties of a space and a module and describe how the multiplicity changes in a family. And these are two additional obstacles that we hit at this point. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to define the multiplicity of the pair. To define the multiplicity of a pair of modules, I have to recall some constructions from last week. So that's what we're doing here. We always start with a submodule of free module, and we have a subalgebra called the Ries algebra, which we construct as follows. If we have a tuple, which represents an element of M, then we just look at the summation of MI, TI, where these are new indeterminates. And then we take the closure of the projectivized row spaces where the rank of the matrix is as big as it gets, and that's the progen of the Ries algebra of M. In the example that we're most interested in, in the Jacobian module, this is the conormal space of X. And we talked about that last week. It's because the rows of the derivative matrix each define tangent hyperplanes. You take the rows, put them into a linear form, and uh, that defines a, a hyperplane. Okay, now, so the sum of them gives us all the hyperplanes. Okay, and then we have a notation for the rejection. Okay, so this is important. So here I have a submodule of N, and I have an element in N. These both generate ideals on the projective analytic spectrum of Rn. And we denote them by rho of H and M. Script calorific allographic N. All right, so how does that work? Well, you take H, right, in terms of set of generators. Then in the chart in which T1 is not equal to zero, we express a generator of H by GI times TI over T1. And the first term in this sum will just be G1 plus the rest of the terms. So that gives us a sheaf of ideals and that's a very useful thing. Now, here's the uh, intersection theoretic definition. We start with this diagram here. Okay. So the idea is that uh, we're going to take the projective analytic spectrum of this, and we're going to blow it up by M. M is an ideal sheaf, so we can blow up by it. Now, because M... Well, because M and N agree, except, well, their integral closures agree, except off the origin. Uh, oh, here's the formula. We'll get, we'll get back to that in a second. Since they agree off the origin, we know the exceptional divisor is compact. And so, therefore, the sum that I have here is going to make sense. We're going to take the exceptional divisor, and we're going to intersect it with some churn classes. The turn classes are CM and CN. Where do they come from? Well, we have two proj bundles, or two proj spaces, so we have two bundles, and we pull those bundles back to this space, and we intersect. Well, you might think that this is hard to work with, but actually it's not really so bad. And during the exercise section on Thursday, we'll do an example in detail where we work out all what these terms are. But for now, let's just try to understand this a little bit. So, what about the uh, what? What about these things? Where does this sit? Well, it's only contained in X D cross. Now, what we've done is remember we projectivize the rows. So, when we projectivize a row, we get an element of P G N minus one, where G of N is the number of generators. So to calculate this, what we want to do is we first intersect this blow up with J hyperplanes from one projective space 
and two G implants, two J hyperplanes from the other one. This will add up to the correct number of hyperplanes altogether. This will define a curve. Then the order of a generic element of M on this curve will be the intersection number. And you can take these constructions and push them down and pull them back. And it makes it facilitates computations. So here's a problem that um, I encourage people to try at least, and we'll do the whole thing out on Thursday. Let's show that, whoops. We know that the multiplicity of this is three already. We know it's three because it's the co-length of M. It's also the co-length of the minors of the maximal ideal. Sorry, the minors of the matrix. The minors are X squared and Y squared. And the co-length of that, uh, oh, and there's an XY too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, here is the, this determinant gives me the xy term. This is the x squared term, and that's the y squared term. So the co-length of that is three. And that's the multiplicity of the module. But we want to do the same thing using the intersection theoretic definition. So try that. All right, so now, the other thing I need to talk about is the polar varieties of the module. And I'll talk about this uh, for the, until the end of our, our session today. And we'll pick it up next time. So Tessier defined the polar varieties of a space as follows. You take a generic projection, take the closure of the points where the rank is less than you would expect, which is D minus L plus one, and that's the definition. So let's look at uh, an example here of that. Supposing we have a cone, okay? Can anyone see the polar curve of this cone just by inspection? Yes, how can you? Take the projection to the Z, Y axis. And so the kernel is going to be the vectors parallel to the X axis. And we see that the kernel is tangent to the cone exactly on the apparent contour. So here we see it. geometrically the polar curve, gamma one, in fact it's co-dimension one of X is a pair of lines. Here I've done the same thing, but I've done it as a calculation. And we just do the, we just calculate here F equals zero and the place with the determinant of the map given by the projection in F is zero. Notice that the kernel of this pi will be tangent to, to F when the, when this has rank one. And so we get that it's two lines. Uh, how about here? Here's another example. This is an example due to Tessier. I had it on the board earlier. This if I work at the origin here, do I see a polar curve? Yes or no? Well, is there an apparent contour? Yep. 
Here's the polar curve. Gamma one of X zero is not empty. No, it is empty, sorry. Yeah, that's right, no, it's right. It is not empty. So this implies that if we think of this as a family of curves, implies the family of curves is not Whitney equisingular, among other things. Damn. There we go. Okay, so it's not equisingular. So the polar curves are tied up with Whitney equisingularity, although we don't understand why yet, but we will. Notice that there is one polar variety you can always get your hands on, and that is the one of codimension zero, because uh, it's XD. If you check out the projections, you'll see that the whole set is a critical set for the projection. Well, there's an alternate construction of gamma L, and I think I will save the alternate construction for next time since I only have three minutes left. So let's use the rest of the period for questions. Are there any? You only look at the uh, regular part, right? To define the polar curve. I'm sorry, can you say that again, please? You only look at the regular part. Oh? Huh? Yeah, that's the right. The closer. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I hope I said that in the definition. Uh, if you, if we, if we look at this apparent contour, we would not include this point if we were being very careful with our construction. And then we would take the closure of the, of these of the apparent contoured smooth points, and that would that would give us the polar curve. Well, I'd like to point out that there is uh, in the polar curves I've been considering are external polar curves, and they are different from this polar curve. So yes. if you take the function and not the variety. The function defining the face, then the polar curve is just every time goes to the middle of the circles. Yes, I think that's so correct. So you should yeah. not mix up the different type of polar yeah. curves. Yeah, it's. Uh, it turns out that there is a very strong relation to good behavior on the part of F and good behavior on the part of the of a hypersurface that F defines. There was a, a nice result of uh, Arasinski that said that if the Hypersurface itself has a Whitney stratification, then the map F satisfies the WF condition. So it's not surprising that we see this linkage. I like the, I like the idea of uh, characterizing the multiplicity of the pair of models as a curvature of, yes. of the pair. And so, uh, in fact, when we look at uh, EIDS that are defined by linear uh, matrices, uh, we don't have to care about uh, the... That's right. The of curvature the pair, of a right? point is trivial. Yeah. And so then the computation of MD, the multiplicity MD, uh, is equivalent to compute uh, the given polar, right? Yeah, yeah. It, we'll see that in the computation of MD, we need both the polar of, of uh, well, it's the relative polar of the stabilization, plus it is the pullback of the polar of the generic mm -hmm. thing. Both mm -hmm. of those are going to come into play to define MD. Nice. Yeah. Thank you.
Maybe it's obvious, but what does the word polar refer to exactly? Right. So if you want to read the, uh, the history of polar varieties, SCA has a, a nice expository article on his website. But uh, uh, to tell you the truth, I never particularly worried about it. I think it has to do with projective geometry. The, the polar is a notion that comes from projective geometry. And if you look at it carefully and squint, it, it's related to our polar varieties here. Yes, Matthias? Yeah, um, I don't know about the history, but I would expect that it's more or less what you showed in your pictures. So think of the, think of the Earth or the surface of the Earth and the generic projection. Uh, where's the critical locus at the poles, right? And if you change your projection, that only means okay, the yeah, poles are a, moving. If you take a projection to the line, that's true. I yeah. see. If you take it to to R two, then you get a you get a whole circle. Yeah. Okay. My, but you're right. If you project to C, that those are the two critical points: the north and the south poles. Thank you.
Matthias, are you there? I think now I am. Are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm here. There, okay. <laughs> there. Yeah. Very good. So I already said this uh, during the break, but not everybody was here. Uh, because we could not finish uh, the lecture regularly this morning, and we had this exercise slot, uh, and everybody involved uh, turned out to, to have time for this, uh, we decided to finish this morning's lecture in this slot, and the exercises, that is the hands-on sessions, will be tomorrow, right? Yes, that's the plan. Okay, so I hope this uh, does not overthrow all of your plans, <laughs> but I think not. So thanks for being here. And I think we can... Do we start with your slides again? or? Yeah, we jump right into the slides. That's the point where we left off. Up to now, we had considered hypersurface singularities. And for hypersurface singularities, many of the problems that we encounter in general just don't show up. So let us consider the ISIS case and also the general case. Actually, I'm going to cover, to be more quickly through it, the general case and then say something about the uh, ISIS case as a special case. So let us just look at a space germ uh, with an isolated singularity at zero given by an idea generated by F1 to Fs. And now for that space germ, we want to compute a Wurzel deformation. So actually, we want to perturb the ideal, we want to perturb our variety. And of course, we need parameters for that. And the simplest possible base space for that is spec C adjoint epsilon modulo epsilon squared. So we have one parameter, and the square of the parameter is even zero. There should be a spec in front of it, sorry. Now, if we look at such a perturbation of our generators F1 to Fs by some power series, G1 to Gs in the original variables, always multiplied by our parameter epsilon. This defines us a flat deformation of x over the base space t0 if and only if the map from i to c adjoint x mod i mapping fi to gi provides us with a well-defined element of the normal module hom c adjoint x from i to c of x mod i. That's a fact that is, has certainly been covered in one of the other lectures. I just wanted to recall it here. For ISIS, this normal module is just a module of rank S over our ring C joint S modulo I times this ring. In more general settings, then of course it will be more difficult to attain and for determinantal singularities, there are ways to compute it if we are in the cohen macaulay co-dimension 2 case. But for the time being, let's just stick to this. So if we have an ideal which is not describing a complete intersection, say again, the three coordinate axes in three space, and we just do any perturbation here, I added one, perturbation to the first generator, nothing to the others, then funny things might happen. Like here, in this case, it's easy to see for you. If t is zero, then we have something of dimension one, the three coordinate axis. But if t is non-zero, then we end up with a set of points. So something ugly has happened here. Something even broke the dimension within the family. That's not what we want. What happened is that among the original generators, there were relations. 
like for example, z times xy minus x times yz is zero. By introducing the perturbation, unfortunately, we broke this relation, you see, so there's a t times z left over here. And this breaking of relations, of course, changed our dimension because before we had non-trivial relations that forced us to be in co-dimension two, even so we had three generators. Now, outside the zero fiber, we don't have these relations and therefore three generators, we are in the general case, we are of core dimension three and that's what, ha what is happening here. So we have to ensure that the relations we had among the original generators also lift to the perturbed generators. And that is precisely what flatness ensures. It ensures that we can lift all relations we had before. Now let us look at the T1. First of all, I'll denote by theta n, the C joint X module with uh, the generators d by dx1 to d by dxn. And we look at the map alpha from theta n to the normal module that takes such a derivation to the map f to theta applied to f. Then the t1 of x is defined as the co-kernel of alpha. If for, the, uh, for a moment, you go back to X being a hypersurface, it's easy to check that you get again your Turner module. For ISIS, there is of course an explicit description here where we have, first of all, the normal module, what we factor out for the normal module, and then the partial derivatives of our tuple F1 to Fs, that F with the underline under it means that we look at the tuple in C adjoint S, X to the S. So we have an explicit description here, but we also have the general description up there. For isolated hypersurface singularities and for ISIS, each first order deformation provides a, um, a contribution to the versal family. So the first order deformations, the set of first order deformations that we get provides a versal family. The reason is that for hypersurface singularities, of course, you cannot have any non-trivial relations. And for complete intersections, the only relations that appear are the so-called causal relations, that is the relations that say fi times fj minus fj times fi is zero. And these lift, of course, automatically. So in both cases, everything is fine. We don't have to worry about flatness. We don't have to worry about anything else. But as soon as we go beyond ISIS, we might be in trouble. Not all first order deformations will be liftable to higher order. In other words, we will not be able to pass from a base space, which is just this simplest fat point T0 to, uh, to one which is inf infinitesimally bigger. Say mod epsilon cubed or a bit higher. So there are obstructions for lifting a first order deformation to higher order deformations to deformations over slightly bigger fat points. And these obstructions that hinder us to lift it will be encoded in what is called the T2 of X. Now, as the last slide, let me just tell you how the T2 is computed. So we start out by looking at a free presentation of our ideal i, seen as an on module. And of course, the map phi you see here, that should be a var phi, not the kind of phi we have here, uh, maps the free bases of os 
to the FI. That's clear. And here we have the relations. Now, we take IR to be the kernel of phi, which is the image of psi, because we are in an exact sequence if we look at three presentations. And we look at a IK, which are those relations that always exist, so-called causal relations. Because if you look at this and you map it via phi, it will go to zero just because fi times fj equals fj times fi. And therefore, we get to an OX linear map, which maps the kernel modulo those relations that always exist, the causal relations, to on to the s modulo i times on to the s, or in other words, to the uh, coordinate ring of our germ to the s. Now, dualizing this, we get another map, capital phi, and T2 is just this co-kernel, the co-kernel of this other map phi. And for the time being, be before you have seen that on some other lecture, please just take it as it is and take it that we can compute free presentations by means of standard bases. We can compute kernels. Of course, this ideal IK is computable without any problem. We can then compute this OX linear map and then we can do the dual, uh, dual of it and look at the co-kernel. So all these steps you saw here are computable. In other words, we have T1, we have T2, and that means we have all the tools we need to compute versal families with maybe the small remark that having everything we need to do it doesn't mean we can do it in finite time because you have to live step by step and you might run into power series situations somewhere for your base or into computations that get so heavy that the computer gets stuck. So you cannot rely on it always finishing, but in theory, all the tools are there. And now we move to the worksheet. And on the worksheet, the first important point is that for the first time in this course, we work with modules. And working with modules is the reason why we didn't want to skip this lecture. So Leonardo, Paulinho, could you move to Matthias' screen, please? Good. There we go. It seems rather dark, the screen. I don't know if there's anything I can do about it in my machine. I think everything is well connected. So if there's anything I should do, let me know, please. So deformations of complete intersections. I brought you a complete intersection. This is a curve singularity because we have two generators. So let's run it. Oh, okay. If you have worked with Oscar, <laughs> you might have seen uh, this problem occurring. Um, it means I didn't start Oscar yet, or the start has been, uh, I think I discarded the start to upload the worksheet. So we have to wait for a bit until Oscar comes up. And maybe that gives us a little time to draw some pictures because there were little pictures up to now in this lecture uh, today. So let's say we have a manifold X or even a circle in R3, right? And then this has a normal bundle, and you can here take small disks in the normal bundle. You have here two directions. The normal bundle is two-dimensional, and it's naively clear that uh, an infinitesimal deformation 
should be something like a vector, uh, vector field in the normal bundle, right? So if you tell to every point on your manifold where it should move next, the direction, then this could account for a section in the normal bundle. And it's kind of a surprise, but also, on the other hand, a, a nice thing that you just uh, forget about the geometry for a moment and you go to the algebra and you just remember the algebraic recipe and you get something that is that you can uh, very well call the normal module instead of a normal bundle. And then everything carries over to singularity theory, right? So, and then you can uh, sit down and meditate on this, that in case you have such a variety in R3, this normal module of X in R3 is what? Well, it's the dual of the one forms uh, which vanish on the tangent space of X. So this could be identified with Kähler differentials that vanish on the tangent space of X. And if you take the dual, then that's exactly what the dual means, right? And this does not only work in the smooth case, here R, R is, let's say, yeah, C, X, Y, Z. This also works in the complex case or also purely algebraic. So that's the object that we start constructing. Let's see whether by now we can do it. Oscar works. Okay, there's our idea. So there comes the normal module. We need to find uh, hom i r mod i. And the good thing that is uh, fairly recent has been implemented by our colleagues is the whole hom world of modules or the whole home package. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's not officially documented uh, yet, but it works and the documentation will come. But let me show you how you can do these things or how you can use these things. Well, first uh, things uh, that you want to do is maybe you want to have a free module and you and say over the ring R, and then you give a rank, and you get a free module, right? The next thing is you want this ideal I, but as a module. So this is a sub-module of a free module of rank one. And that's how we realize it here. We first set up R as a free module. And we have to do this in the computer algebra because uh, the type of F1 here is really different from R, right? By saying F1, the free module of rank one over R, we tell the computer how we want to have this object understood. And the same has to happen with the ideal. The ideal has to be turned explicitly into a sub-module of that module. And we can do it like this, sub F1. And then here comes a list. And this is again, this Python style list. We just multiply all of the generators of our ideal, whoops, yeah, for G in the generators of our, our ideal, we multiply G with the first generator of the module, right? Here we could also say F2. And that would give us the second generator of the other module F. So this sub command will set up the sub module for us. And as is the, usually the case, it returns the sub module itself. Plus as an additional uh, information here would come the map, the inclusion map of this sub module. We have no real need for this inclusion map at this point. So we discard it. So what's the other ingredient that we need for this normal module? It's uh, here, R mod I. We already saw how to 
construct a quotient ring, but again, in this case, we do not need a quotient ring. We need another interpretation of that. We need this as a quotient module, right? We need it as tree module, modulo submodule. And I call this R mod I, and I, to set it up as a module, I use the same command, the same function, the quo command, but I'm feeding it objects of a different type. And some of you may know this from other programming language, there's a dispatch on the signature of what you're feeding, right? The, the function is intelligent enough to distinguish whether it eats apple or pear, and depending on what it gets fed, it produces different results. So here I'm feeding the free module of rank one and this sub module of F1, and we get out the R mod I. So, and before, let's maybe erase this for the moment and shift it to the, to the next cell because that will be important. So what we, let's have a look at the, at the result. We can once look at I mod, uh, I mod, also I as a module, and it will tell us, okay, it's more or less the same, only uh, here we have our two generators of the ideal, and then here the standard gener one generator of our free module. The other thing is R mod I, okay. And it tells us this is a quotient. So the ambient module is free of rank one. And here we have the relations of this quotient module. And this is already, I think this will be a great uh, advantage over singular to have these, uh, these modules in this form. Good. So next comes the real crucial thing. Uh, who has ever tried to compute a home module with a singular or somewhere else? Did this ever happen to you? No. <laughs> then you can hardly imagine the, the pain that this can cause. <laughs> so here uh, it's all ready for us to, to be used. We can compute this home module. Well, if you if you were to really compute this, you would have to find a presentation for the ideal. It is a short exact sequence like that with a matrix here. You would have to dualize. So apply whoop, apply this home functor in the first argument. Ah, it's a little squeezed, sorry. Apply that to that sequence and then take the kernel of what you get here in this spot. It's a, it's a tedious task that for, uh, for sure you never want to do by hand unless you know the result. And here you get even more. So what do you, what do you get here in this command? in this line nine, you get the normal module N, the thing that we want to have. And again, we get a map. And this time we will not throw away the map because this map has a very uh, good and useful information for us, which is every vector, every element of the home module is a homomorphism. It cannot be a module element and a homomorphism at the same time for the computer. The computer always needs to, to know which one of the two we are talking about right now. So this vec to home, as I called it here, it can serve us to switch from one side to the other. Let's see this in action. Well, let's just take one of the elements in our module N I take the first generator. I could also say here, let's take X times the first generator. And then it will tell me what this is for the computer. It says, okay, you gave me this. It's a sub quo element. So it's a normal, let me tell you, this is the normal type for module element. 
And now I say, yeah, this is a homomorphism. Let's apply it to, to something from here, right? So V is in this home. And I want to apply this as a function to that, yes? Uh, I'm taking I. And algebraically, it doesn't make a difference. I wrote the I squared, modulo I squared. I wrote to explain this uh, passing through Kähler differentials, but it's not not important I, a posteriori. So I can try to compute V of G. It doesn't work, right? It complains. It says this is not a callable object, which uh, translates to this is not a function. Don't try to give it G to digest. But we can use this vector home and turn it into uh, an honest homomorphism. And the intermediate output here is, what is phi? Well, phi is a map. And then I can apply phi to this. Oh, I could also take the same g again, right? And there we go. x times, uh, minus x times e of 1. So that's... Uh, that's how you can make use of the real whole home package. Any questions until here? Good, then let's... Uh... Maybe stress at that point that we took the time to really say something about the particularity of using a computer algebra system and using HOM here as a command uh, because it's important if you want to work with it, you'll run into those problems for sure. Uh, sorry, which problems? The problems of this is an ideal or this is a submodule of a rank one module or the problem of this is a module element and this is an, uh, a homomorphism. Those problems are not obvious to the mathematician but as soon as you want to teach the computer to do something, you run into those ambiguities you never thought about when working on paper. I just wanted to stress that point again. Yeah, uh, and maybe uh, I said this has been programmed by our colleagues, so I should maybe say who this was. This uh, is the Janko Böhm and Alexander Dinges, two colleagues uh, from Kaiserslautern. And, uh, yeah, it's their work that we <laughs> we present here today. So um, we want to compute the T1. We had this normal module. We have it. So th what did we need to do with it? Remember that from this uh, from this infinitesimal deformations, we need to take away those deformations that come from uh, homotopies or whatever, switching around the ambient space, right? If I have this this uh, line here in three space and I have a wind that blows my line, this is a trivial deformation of the line. Right? So algebraically, how is that reflected? I need to mod out by the image of the vector fields on the ambient space. And I think we had this map on the, on the slides already. Yeah, that was the map alpha in my notation. Okay, so here it's theta. And this is a rather tedious computation. I mean, you see all the indices there uh, and you have to fight this fight for yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just, uh, you have to sit down and do the meditation there. So then we can set up this map and eventually I mean, take this, take this as a code sample. <laughs> and if you need some help to decipher it, uh, we can do this tomorrow in the exercise sessions. And then let me just execute this. Ooh, yeah, something's missing. So DF is the Jacobi matrix, Jacobian matrix. And basically you have to mod out by the image of the Jacobian matrix. That's, uh, that's, everything that there is to it, only that 
you have to make this appropriately compatible with the module structure that you're given on the normal module. So, ah, there we go. We already have our, our result. So let's just quickly say what this is. We set up another free module uh, of rank equal to the number of variables in our ring uh, reserved for the for the partial derivatives or for the yeah for the partial derivatives in the Jacobian matrix. Then we set up this map theta from above, and then the image of a homomorphism is again a submodule of the codomain, and we can take the quotient of the codomain by that submodule. And we get this T1 that we saw in the slides. And then here, the last one, the last command is again something that has not yet made it into the official Oscar. It's monomial counting, just like in the for the Milner algebra, right? And it's a little bit more tedious. <laughs> uh, you can, I can give you the, the code, um, but you have some samples already in the worksheets for the hypersurface cases, and it's just more, a little more complicated than the hypersurface. And in the end, it's, it's the same thing. So the only thing that you have to keep in mind is go to the leading module instead of the leading ideal, and then do the combinatorics in each of the entries. That is the bit that is a bit more complicated than in the ideal case. There's not more to it. Uh, actually, there is more to it because you need to pass from the sub quo uh, presentation of the module to an honest presentation as we have it here as a presentation of the ideal I, right? So yes. you know for, for Yes, you're right, there are technicalities to it, but the idea is basically the same. Well, I think this is one of the things which only makes sense to go into detail when you do it yourself. Exactly. Right? Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you will just be lost in the trans uh, in the in the explanations. So, what do we get here? This is a five-element list, or Julia always says a vector, but it's a five-element list, and it gives me exactly the five. Uh, monomials, so to say, in the module with which I have to perturb my um, the generators of my function. Of your S5 singularity. And the yeah. lower index of the S5 says, yes, it should be five of them. And that's correct here. So I perturb the first generator by Y and Z and constant and the second one by constant and y let's see what uh, what these generators were so first one by constant y and z well that should be the other way around right anna do you know you let's see No, that, that should be okay, I think, unless something was was switched. I could now compute that on paper quickly and tell you whether it was switched or not. Maybe you continue and I calculate it. I think it's not so super uh, important, but I mean that, that we get five already yields that we're on the right path. Uh, but it's important for the exercises tomorrow. Right. We can do that again in the exercises, or we will eventually. So with this, you can write down, or you should be able to write down the full, uh, the full, um, the full equations of the family. Let's once do that. X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, and then here we go plus. And first parameter u1 times constant plus u2 times, uh, what was it, x 
I have to. Oh, here's here's my screen. No, you one times uh, y and z. Plus u3 times z, and the other one u4 times x, uh, no, constant, and plus u5 times, uh, what was it? I have to run back. I think it was y. Why? Why? Okay. And Matthias, the calculation is correct. It's just not what we expected because we took a different ordering. Yeah. Different so, uh, orderings can produce non, non nice looking results easily. So actually, we are taking a basis of this vector space, a monomial basis, and the monomial basis is taken combinatorially with respect to the leading module we got, and the leading module depends on the ordering we have chosen. It will have the same dimension, it will represent the same thing, but it might look different for different orderings. Good, and I think some people could have done all the computations by hand anyway, <laughs> in the first place. So uh, this is how you can automate, uh, automatize it. All right, Anne, do you want to say something more towards versal deformations of arbitrary singularities? Or should we just go ahead here in the... Let's just go ahead here. I mean, I already had T1 and T2 on the slides. So all the data is there and the rest we leave to Oscar so that we don't need to make our hands dirty with all those calculations that we could of course explain but shouldn't if we want to stay on time because we have just a few minutes left, I think. Ah, oh, that's right. Okay, so this is, might be a nice way to, to finish uh, this series now. We saw this morning, no, not this, this morning. Yes. Pink example, okay, Pinkham's example has been mentioned today several times, right? Yeah. And yesterday it was also mentioned that we have the versal deformation of this singularity in Pinkham's example, it has two components in the parameter space with uh, different properties of the deformations that can occur on both components. So let's, um, let's try to reproduce that example here. And you may recognize this matrix here. This is one of the forms to describe Pinkham's example and one of the ways we can harvest this ideal. So let's do this in two steps. First, we run it and we get the, all of the generators. And then here I allowed myself to uh, wrap another functionality from Singular to produce this versal unfolding with the methods that you have seen in Anna's presentation. That means you compute the T1. We have done this for the ISIS, but you also compute this very complicated T2. And actually, when you go to Pinkham's paper, you will find one, example, uh, one instance there where he does all these computations by hand, I think. It's very short. You will have to fill a lot of uh, computational gaps, but it's possible in, in theory. So, Singular can do that as well. Just have to wait a little. Oh dear, <laughs> that's the output. Uh, this is the output in due to everything being still under construction. Right? That sometimes produces, uh, in, uh, produces side effects that we don't really want. So let me explain what happens here. I mean, Singular would have given you a list of polynomials, a list of lists of polynomials with, um, with the manual how to interpret them. Here I return you two, uh, two maps the, called ink 
and the other one I call it P. And what is it? It is the inclusion of the central fiber in the family um, over the base space, right? So this is ink and this is the projection of the parameter. And let us investigate a little bit uh, what we have. So we can look at the domain of the inclusion. And what this is, is the germ of this central fiber. So we have a ring, polynomial ring. Then we have the ideal from Quinkham's example from above. And the last information is we have localized at the origin. Okay, so far so good, uh, nothing unexpected. Then the domain of P, which is the versal, uh, the, the total space of the deformation. Here we have another polynomial ring, which has some additional variables, A, B, C, D. And they come from the deformation parameters. Here I call them U, singular has other naming conventions, A, B, C, D. And you have the whole ideal for the, the total space, rather complicated ideal. Also something was messed up a little bit with the indexing of the X variables nothing we can do about it. So it's not really a surprise that this looks ugly, even if the at was not there, because also here in the, in the ISIS case already it gets messy. But what is interesting is the codomain of P, because this is the parameter space. And here you see actually the two components of the parameter space of allowable deformations, which are arising because of a non-trivial T2. Right, And you have these relations here among the parameters. So we could do a primary decomposition of um, this. This should work. And there we see the two components over which the different smoothings of the of Bingham's example arise. The first one is just the hyperplane defined by the zero locus of the A coordinate. And this corresponds to one matrix representation of this, uh, of this singularity. And this is the other component, which is only a line, which in one direction is going off diagonally. And this corresponds to the three by three matrix representation as a symmetric matrix singularity of Pingham's example. Good. Questions? All right, Anne, anything more we need to say? There's something I want to add at that point. There's a lot of singularity stuff in Oscar and in particular for this deformation part. In singular. But it is it is only wrapped as a singular dot whatever. It's not originally written in Oscar's stuff that we can leave that way. Involved procedures, but there are others that we want to have as a native Oscar routine, and there is still a lot of work to be done. Help is welcome, in particular, if you want to program your own uh, routines for your research, please contribute because Oscar can only be such a success as Singular was if people use it and contribute to it. We are trying to wrap as much into Oscar from Singular as possible, and we are trying to reprogram those parts that are important to be reprogrammed because either they are a hassle in Singular or because they are just many small, very useful procedures but this is work in progress. We are not reporting on a finished system. We are reporting on something that is in the process of evolving here, but on a solid basis 
and which has the potential to be as useful as Singular was and even more useful by the link to polyhedral geometry, for example. Right. So first things that come to mind is images of maps. I think there's very little in Singular. Let's do it in Oscar, right? Or yeah, and there is something in Oscar already, or I think. Lipschitz geometry, I heard rumors say that things are eventually computable. Let's try, right? So we are open source. We are happy to help you coding. Let's go. All right, so that's it. Yeah, and for once, for once we are not over time, I hope. Sorry, Anne, you, I think you, we couldn't understand you. I said, for once, we are not over time. Almost, almost. I think we're... Ah. <laughs> All right, yeah. So see you tomorrow morning for the hands-on session. The exercise sheet is uploaded. I don't know whether the link has already been added to the, to the conference website, but you find the exercise sheet in the same place as the other stuff. And otherwise, uh, yeah. Let me know. I'll be happy to, to help you. Good. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone.